Coming up on This Week in Radio Tech, Chris Ark is with us. He has enormous experience doing live remote broadcasts in the field in lots of situations, local stations, regional, and network nationwide opportunities. Great advice is straight ahead on Twerk. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by the new Ruby console from Lavo. See Lavo in your future at lavo.com slash twerk. And by... Omnia 11, because great sound matters most. Now shipping with the new GeForce Dynamics engine as standard. Omnia 11, great sound matters most. Hey, welcome into This Week in Radio Tech, the show where we talk about everything from the uh, microphone to the light bulb at the top of the tower. And it is delightful to uh, to be here with you. Uh, I'm Kirk Harnack, your host. Today, we've got a great show. It's on the whole subject of remote broadcasts. And uh, we're going to be t- talking with a guest who has done a lot of these at the local level and the network level. Um, we'll introduce him in just a few minutes. But uh, uh, you're going to get a lot of good advice on planning a, a live outside broadcast, uh, whether it's just voice or music involved, whatever it is, uh, we've got some great advice for you on how to get that signal collected, uh, get the audio mixed and get it sent back to the network or to the radio station, whatever you're doing. So this is great advice for those engineers and interns who may be uh, new at setting up remote broadcast, uh, whether it's for uh, you know ball games, sporting events, uh, a, a grand opening of a, of a car dealership uh, or whatever it may be. So or a live concert. And we're going to talk about uh, live music. Too. So that, that's all coming up on this week in, in Radio Tech. So as I mentioned, uh, I'm out of my usual studio. I'm in Riga, Latvia, and uh, we've had some uh, meetings here. Uh, the Telos Alliance is having some meetings here. We're training uh, dealers and some other interested parties, presenting technology ideas, and uh, really looking into the future. So that's uh, it's been pretty exciting uh, to be here. And it's midnight here. Actually, where I am, it's the next day. It's already June 1st, and everybody else on the show is, is uh, suffering through Thursday. <laughs> I'm already into Friday here in uh, in Riga, Latvia, and I wish uh, I wish it was a little earlier and I could show you outside. It's finally it's dark outside, but the sun doesn't set here until about 10 p.m. and then it takes almost an hour for the sky to get really dark because we're way up north here in Riga, Latvia. We're almost the same latitude as say uh, Saint Petersburg, Russia. Uh, actually, we're just about even with Moscow. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting that what you get and, and the sun, the morning daylight, even if you shut the curtains on the hotel room, light starts spilling in like an invader about four forty-five in the morning. So you get precious little sleep here during the summer because the sun is just really bur- burning up in, into the, into the hotel. So enough about this and where I am, uh, let's, uh, check in on Chris Tobin. Looks like he's coming to us from one of his usual hangouts in Newark, New Jersey. Hey, Chris. Hello, hello, Kirk. Yeah, I am. You know, it's funny you're talking about being there and it's already tomorrow. I feel like an episode of Doctor Who. Some timey-wimey thing here, you know, I'm talking to you in the future. <laughs> yeah. So, hey, uh, how's, by the way, the, the weather here has been amazing. And sometimes we do chat about the weather as, as people are wont to do. Uh, w- there's a high pressure system over uh, Scandinavia moving along kind of slowly. We've had clear skies, sunny skies, and amazing temperatures. Like during the day, it's getting up to about, I don't know, 82, 85 degrees, something like that. It's just really nice. In the evenings, it's just, you know, you walk down the boulevards. And actually, I said I'm in Riga, Latvia. That's not quite true. Uh, I'm about 10 miles from Riga in a beach town called Yormala. And Yormala back in the day, back in the Soviet days, because the Soviet Union you know, you know, took over uh, Estonia, uh, uh, Latvia, and Lithuania. And uh, then they, they each got their freedoms back in the, I think, the mid-1980s. Anyway, Yormala was a very popular place for higher-ups in the Communist Party uh, from Moscow to come vacation, because they don't have a beach in Moscow but they have a beach here and it's on the Baltic sea. It's actually on the Gulf of Riga, which is right off the Baltic sea, uh, but it's salt water and, uh, and it's absolutely lovely here. And it's no wonder that uh, those who were very well connected with the Kremlin uh, or other higher ups, uh, maybe just other successful business people, um, uh, uh, certainly not the, not the working class, but the uh, higher ups would come here uh, on their uh, on the new jet service back in the 1960s and have their vacations uh, right here in Yormala. So it's a it's a beautiful beautiful town. So anyway, that that's my story. I'm sticking to it. Chris, how's the weather in in uh, in the New York area today? Well, in the New York area today, it's overcast skies. We've had rain on and off. Um, as far as I can tell, it looks like a low pressure coming through and it's going to be some unsettled weather. I think uh, tomorrow 
Oh, is it Saturday? Yeah, Saturday is when the rain's going to really hit and the uh, uh, high pressure is coming in and the temperatures are changing. So, next couple of days, it's going to be sort of like Seattle. At least we had a musician in today and she was talking about how today reminded her, this week has reminded her of her time in Seattle. So, it's overcast and a little drizzle here and there. And it's about 68 degrees well, Fahrenheit right now. Well, Chris, you have done a ton of remote broadcast yourself, and you've been involved at the network level in, in dealing with such things. Uh, our guest, uh, by the way, his first name is also Chris. So this, I, I think we'll figure out who we're talking to uh, when we uh, uh, banter back and forth. <coughs> Excuse me, But our guest is Chris Ark, A-R-K, Chris Ark, uh, and he is in Michigan right now. Welcome in, Chris Ark. Glad to have you here. Thank you very much for having me, guys. I appreciate it. Well, we're certainly glad to have you. And Chris, why don't you just kind of give us the little elevator speech? You, we've, you're just introducing yourself to our audience. Who is Chris Ark? And uh, you know what? You, you seem like a young guy, and yet you're pretty experienced with with remote broadcast. Uh, talk to us about Chris. Uh, well, well, you made me feel a bit old on your uh, promotion of uh, today's session because you said young-ish. It really <laughs> helped hit home that I'm not a spring chicken anymore. <laughs> but uh, uh, no, I mean, uh, relatively, I'm, I'm really young in the game. You know, I'm only going to be going. I'm 33 years old. Been doing broadcasting for about 10 years. Um, kind of got jumped into it uh, by some mentors. Uh, my, my background was initially in uh, live theatrical production then kind of rolled over into live audio concert production and then I saw a, a deficiency coming up as far as uh, engineers coming up in the game that, you know, the, their hair keeps getting grayer and there's no one really to replace them. So I saw an opportunity to uh, capitalize and, and get in while the getting's good. Um, so, yeah, you know, I originally started off in radio just just being a board op for a syndicated radio show, Home Improvement Radio Show out of Arizona. Uh, and then mm -hmm. from there, it opened up other opportunities to uh, meet some chief engineers in the Phoenix area. Um, so, you know, I eventually, uh, got my chance to sweep floors, uh, change light bulbs and change some transmitter filters and finally got my first assistant gig over at, uh, what, which was Sandusky and now it's Hubbard radio, uh, there in Phoenix. Uh, from there, jumped on over to, uh, CBS radio, uh, their cluster there in Phoenix and then, uh, kind of bounced back over to doing the live production stuff with the UFC and, uh, now I'm kind of just doing contract work on my own, but I'm actually getting ready to move to Seattle here in a few days and uh, start the next next chapter of my career. Awesome. Well, there's there's plenty of work to do in uh, in, in Seattle. I'm, uh, I I happen to know that, so uh, I know you'll you'll get busy there after you move there. Uh, and I believe uh, earlier in the uh, when we were talking before the show, you said you got a chance to work with uh, quite a famous engineer. A lot of folks know him. It's Eric Schechter. Is that right? Oh, yes. Yes. Eric Schechter, he is a force to be reckoned with. He is uh, the go-to for every issue that I might have that has a big question mark next to it. Um, <laughs> he doesn't always tell you what you want to hear, but he's going to tell you the truth and he's going to show you the way. So I, I owe yeah. a lot of my career to Eric. Absolutely. So what turned me on uh, to Chris Ark, folks, is uh, an article that I came across. Uh, Chris, is, is your website CRA Audio? Is, is that you? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, so CRAaudio.com. And you have an article there that you wrote yourself. It's called Remote Broadcast Setups and Strategies for the Young Broadcast Engineer. And so I'm, I'm, I'm way too old to be reading this stuff, but you've got some great advice here. And I thought that, you know, for our show today, uh, Chris, you could just kind of take us through uh, your introduction, your pre-planning, um, your station feed and backhaul options, just some of the things that you've got in this article and take us through, you know, with some degree of, of detail, leave our audience members with a sense of, uh, hey, if, if, you know, basically almost remote broadcasting for dummies and a, re and a, pri and a, a refresher for the rest of us, right? So I'll bet you know sure. some tip tips and tricks that even, you know, guys like me who've done a ton of remote broadcasts you know, back in the landline and Marty days, uh, that, that I can still learn some things. And then folks uh, who are uh, newer to the industry, that they can learn from you from either from mistakes, from good planning, and find out how to carry off a good remote broadcast. And and so, Chris, while you're thinking about uh, answering that, I should uh, uh, mention that our show, This Week in Radio Tech, is brought to you by a couple of terrific sponsors. Uh, first of all, the TELUS Alliance, uh, my employer. And we've got an important message from the TELUS Alliance that has to do with uh, remaining on their mailing list because of this uh, this GDPR um, uh, ruling, a rule uh, that uh, 
uh, is going in effect in Europe, but any company that does business around the world has to comply with it. So uh, don't want you to miss out on good stuff from the TELUS Alliance. So we'll talk about that. And also brought to you by the folks at Lavo at lavo.com slash twerk where you'll find uh, Lavo's uh, a, a whole line of uh, products for the radio industry. And so you'll, we'll check it out there. We'll hear from each of these folks uh, in, in just a few minutes. Um, Chris Tobin. So uh, I had not heard of Chris Ark until, I don't know, about a month ago or so, maybe five, six weeks ago, and uh, really enjoyed uh, reading his article. So uh, I'll start with Chris Tobin for a second here. Chris, you've been involved with a ton of remotes, haven't you? Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I can say that I've done I've done a lot. I've done my share, and uh, they've been fun. They've been a learning experience. Uh, they have not all been successful. Uh, I will <laughs> say that um, failure is not an option. But though, when you do fail and realize why, the next time you don't, um, you know, it, yeah, I, I will say I've been <laughs> I've done some crazy stuff. I have a friend of mine who calls me from time to time and says I'm trying to do a broadcast from a location. What is your suggestion? I was like, where is it? And he tells me, I'm like, hmm, you might want to consider this, this, and this. He's like, why? I, I, that has nothing to do. Yeah, it has a lot to do with your setup. Trust me. And then after the event's over, he'll call me a month or two later. Yeah, you were right. I definitely shouldn't have done what you said not to do, and I did it anyway, and it failed. I was like, yeah, that's because I did it three times. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I, I, I will say I've had my share. It's great times, good stuff, and locations around the world and right here in the States too. So it's, it's been fun. Oh, cool. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. And Chris, I remember you've talked to me about using even, uh, using all, all different manner of, of getting audio back from a remote site, having ISDN installed on a, on a, on a light standard, you know, in, in New York city, which apparently is a thing you can have that done. Uh, and, and oh, yeah. I didn't know you could. Yeah. I didn't know you could. I thought it had to go yeah, into a house or you, a building. If, if you know how to talk the language and you scope out, you do a site survey, you know, you go to your location for the uh -huh. broadcast in advance. And if you understand how the phone company functions and how their infrastructure is designed, you can get an ISDN circuit uh, landed at a lamppost in New York City. Well, you couldn't back in the day. Nowadays, you're not going to get yeah. squat. <laughs> Maybe but, not now. Um, yeah. <laughs> I did. Yeah, I did ISDN. We did DSL. And DSL was an interesting one because there was two types of DSL at, in the day. That was what they oh. used to call the dry DSL. And you say to yourself, what's the difference between dry and wet? Wet and audio would be reverb. Well, we're not putting reverb on the DSL. So it, it turns out that if you don't want to have a dial tone associated with the DSL circuit, which means all oh, another crazy building situation, you can order it without dial tone and still have a seven-digit phone number attached to it. Ah, <laughs> uh, seven-digit phone number. No dial and tone. by doing it that <laughs> way, you avoid one of the internal departments at, in this case, Verizon, uh, because mm -hmm. of the way the tariffs are written for DSL and what they oh. call retail phone service. So yeah. by not doing it and strictly staying within the business sector of the, the company, you, you can get DSLs in a lot of places that you wouldn't expect before. And uh, hey, yeah, we did a lot of stuff here in New York City. We did DSL to mm -hmm. RF, ISDN to RF. We did microwave, oh. portable transmitters to wireless. I did three wireless hops in Times Square, which was interesting. Uh, that worked. That was a that was a good one. Defied the defied the laws of physics, according to some. And uh, uh, Mike Mason at CP Communications, I think, he if he remembers correctly, every time I call him and rented a gear from him, and I would ask him for certain types of antennas for the RF kits, he would ask, "Okay, I know we have them. No one's ever requested them before. What are you going to do with these things? Like, <laughs> after I'm set up and functioning, I'll send you pictures." And one of the pictures I sent to him was from a high atop of the Marriott Hotel across from the 9-11 uh, pit, the, the former World mm. Trade Center location back in the day for the yeah. first anniversary. And he, he calls me up and he's like, let me get this straight. You are using those wireless gear and your news reporters are on the street in the pit down below. I said, yeah. And you're not having any issues. I was like, no, actually, I'm not. I'm actually using the uh, the physics of the receiver antenna and the, the filtering systems and the way they function. And it's working out just nicely. He's like, okay, all right, got it. We're going to send make a kit then for you from now on when you call. Just give it this kit number and we'll ship it to you. Don't even worry about assembling it. And that's, <laughs> we that's the kind of remote stuff that I've done. And, and uh, you know, you practice, you learn. You 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 um. What was that Clint Eastwood line? Man's got to know his limitations. <laughs> That's right. So, so we got to hear this whole story. So, so, yeah. yeah. And I know there's a lot of folks out there listening going, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You need to understand 
you, the limitations of the technology, the venue, the people you're working with, uh, the equipment you decide to take, and the time frame in which you need to work. And once you have that under control, or at least within some control, I'm pretty sure you could have a 99% success rate of your remotes. I'm sure Chris Ark would probably agree with that. Well, we're going to find out. So, um, uh, with with all, with that build up, uh, and, and Chris has done plenty of this stuff. Chris, uh, again, welcome into the show. I'm looking forward to to hearing about your planning. And I guess planning is, is the first part of this. You've probably planned a number of different kinds of remotes, but I'm not sure where you want to start the conversation, Chris. So start it wherever you like, and uh, we're going to sit back and and listen and and learn. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, Chris hit it on the head. You know, preparation is 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 you know, the biggest factor to doing this site check, site check, site check, because you don't know what variables you're going to run into, uh, you know, regardless if you're running, um, you know, IP, ISDN, hard, you know, hardline, wireless, you know, there's all sorts of different factors that you need to get figured out during that site check. And two most important things for me when going in there is, is power and how am I getting audio to and from the, uh, uh, the broadcast studio? Because without that, there is no remote broadcast. You might as well get on your cell phone and uh, do a good old call in. So, um, yeah, you know, uh, uh, you know, with power, if we could, you know, start there, you know, being an audio guy, more amperage, the better for me, because, you know, coming from a live background, you know, when that kick drum hits and that hits your amp, you know, you need to make sure you have plenty of amperage there. So I'm always trying to seek out the 20 amp circuit uh, wherever I'm going to be broadcasting from. Now, odds are you're not going to probably be provided with a 20 amp circuit. So 15 amp circuit will, should be more than enough to power all of your equipment. Um, but you know, other things you have to consider when, uh, uh, you're looking at power is, is it a shared circuit? Do you have a dedicated circuit? Mm, well, yeah. if, if, you know, if not say that you're, uh, doing a remote broadcast out on a plaza for a big concert, well, there's going to be radio row and you might not have a PA set up, but the station down the way might have a PA set up. And if they really crank that thing up, your broadcast could go down like that. So you need to be uh, uh, aware of who's using that circuit. Um, also helps to know how much power or amperage your equipment is pulling initially. So just so that way you have some frame of reference going into it, knowing this is my bare minimum requirement for power. Uh, and you could do that by, you know, setting all your equipment up in your shop and then putting an amp clamp on the uh, uh, power conditioner uh, that you're plugging everything into. So, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. yeah, so p power considerations are huge because without power, I mean, unless you have a self-contained, you know, uh, access unit, NX unit uh, where, you know, you have a battery built in. But uh, most of my broadcasts that I do, they're, they're day long broadcasts. And this article was really written around uh, a, a uh, country music festival that I go out and uh, uh, do production management for called Country Thunder uh, out in Florence, Arizona with Entercom Radio, formerly CBS. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, a lot of this article, it applies to bigger remote broadcasts, but a lot of the um, things that are touched on are really universal, regardless if it's a van stop, car dealership, or a four day long broadcast. And, and regardless of which one you're at, you need power. Um, I'm, so I'm the other, Chris, if, if you go to the Ford dealership, if, if the radio station sells a remote, the Ford dealership and, and you go out and scope it out, you, you know, there's nobody in charge of the power really. I mean, there's, there's no electrician on duty. So it's up to you, the engineer to figure out, okay, that plug looks good. I hope there's nothing else, you know, on this circuit. No, no big printer or something else is going to suck down a lot of power. Hope the janitor doesn't come by and plug in his vacuum cleaner during the remote. Um, but you're on your own. But when you go to a venue that's more professionally managed, and maybe you, you even get a chance beforehand to meet you know th those management people, then is that a situation where you get to request, hey, I need 20 amps here. I need two 20 amp drops over here. Uh, is anybody else going to be on, on this? Is, is, do you get to arrange that kind of stuff beforehand? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, again, it's venue specific. Uh, you know, like you said, if you're going to a car dealership, kind of what you get is what you get and you pray for the best. Uh, but, you know, if you go to like a Live Nation venue, I mean, they have, you know, 400 amp service just for one half of the building. So odds are you're going to be able to work with the in-house staff to, you know, really lay out your requirements and, and get it taken care of ahead of time. But sometimes that's that's still not an option. So you ever take you a... 
I, I, know, I know they can be kind of heavy, but do you ever take a, a big UPS with you in, in case in the middle of a, of a nationwide or a big broadcast, uh, your power goes out and you're at least prepared for a few minutes. You got a few minutes to scramble. Oh, absolutely. I have uh, uh, APC UPSs, the big rack mount units uh, mm -hmm. at pretty much every broad last broadcast location I have uh, out at Country oh. Thunder. Uh, if it's a smaller uh, car dealership, I'll bring one of the little small brick units out with me just so I have some sort of reaction time. Um, mm -hmm. So, so yeah, it's, it's, it's really dependent on the size of the venue of what UPS I bring with me, but absolutely. That's, that's a great idea. To, to I had never thought of bringing a UPS to a venue uh, until you mentioned power concerns. So, okay, that's something to add to the toolbox or the budget request so you can at least have a few minutes of power if you if get kicked off. Yeah. And remember to test that UPS before you take it out with you because those, those batteries might be on the hairy edge of just going dead on you, and that's the last thing you want. So, again, preparation, preparation, preparation. Yeah, cool. Okay, so when you go to, the, to a, a venue to scope it out, you've talked about power. What, what else are you looking for? Well, well, one other thing I want to mention on power, which is is it's overlooked quite a bit, is where are you running your power cables? Um, is it granny proof? As in, you know, are people going to be tripping over it? Um, but almost more importantly, two things. Where are you running that cable? Are you running it across a door threshold where that metal door could expose the conductors of that cable and then potentially electrify that door. You know, I've seen, you know, copper strands poking right out of a cable that I've seen PAs using before and my heart just about stopped. Um, uh, so you want to be cognizant of where you're, you're placing your cables for safety's sake. Uh, the other thing that I've noticed is, you know, people use extension cables with no ground pins on them. Uh, mm. I, I, I it, that's a really big bugaboo for me because, you know, if that, that equipment becomes electrically hot for whatever reason, that current needs a place to go, which is ground instead of electrifying that equipment. So if you go to tweak a knob and accidentally touch the metal chassis of that unit, you know, that can be, become electrified and you get a little bit of a shock there. So that's, you know, again, the last thing that we want to do. Um, okay. And then the last, the last thing on power is, um, I've seen people totally unplug uh, my extension cable killing my broadcast to simply plug in a cell phone, you know, the on-air talent to plug in their cell phone. Oh, so oh. word of the wise and from experience, deploy uh, a, a power strip specifically with a sign that says cell phone charging and your your issues will probably go away with that. <laughs> you make it obvious. That's great. Because if you don't, yeah. somebody could pull that power. Oh, that's a great idea. So yeah, you know, cell uh, phone charging. So. So in closing on power, you know, there's other stuff, you know, take a non-contact voltage tester with you or a three prong yep. uh, tester to make sure that, you know, you're getting ground uh, because there could be an issue with that circuit. And the last thing you want to do is find out when the, the unit has become electrically hot um, and then have a voltmeter with you. Um, even if you don't know what all these little dials do here and all these little functions, at the very least, you should know what the uh, uh, AC voltage uh, uh, portion of it does. Test how yeah. much voltage is coming into your equipment, because if you're over or under, uh, uh, you know, say between 110 and 120 volts, you know, that, that equipment can do some pretty funky stuff. And, and you don't want to find out when you're in the middle of uh, uh, an interview with, say, you know, uh, uh, Brooks and Dunn or, you know, Brantley Gilbert. You know, that's the last thing you want to do is have your equipment go down. Well, uh, yeah. And, and I suppose with all the different uh, power uh, standards that there are. It's it's conceivable if, if somebody's you know tapping you into some power, you know, even if a somewhat qualified person, they could accidentally pop you into 277 volts, you know, or yeah, or, or or 240. Uh, with their auto, there ought, to, there ought to be 125 volts. That's a great great uh, idea. Is be sure you just check for the voltage before you plug into it. As, you know, if look if it's in a home or in a business, that outlet's probably been used over and over again. And if there was a problem there, it would would have gotten figured out before you got to it. But at a temporary sure. venue where they're running temporary lines, even in let's say a trade show environment, the, the, those are a lot of those are, are you know, they're temporary. They're they're put in just for the trade show. Now they've done this over and over again, but still that's a great idea. Take 10 seconds and measure that voltage. You know, you know, mistakes happen. And the last thing you want to do is find out a mistake on your own when it when it comes to power. <laughs> you know, Ooh. you know, uh, uh, crummy audio is one thing. But uh, when you're dealing with power in people's lives, no remote broadcast is worth uh, somebody getting hurt over. 
So I want to remind folks who are listening or watching, uh, this is This Week in Radio Tech, episode 397. Chris Ark is our guest, and we kind of uh, took a few minutes to get going, but uh, Chris is talking about scoping out a remote site uh, to do a live remote broadcast. And uh, we've covered power. we got a lot more to cover, but we also need to, uh, to take a quick break and tell you about the folks who make this broadcast possible, this podcast possible. And uh, uh, first of all, it's our friends at the Telos Alliance. Now, I'm going to tell you about the Telos Alliance, and remember our director. Direct Current. This is a, uh, a weekly e-newsletter that goes out uh, to people all over the world. And uh, here's a copy of it right here. This is from just a couple weeks ago. Uh, why broadcasters like you love AOIP, audio over IP. Uh, every week you're going to find two, three, four articles in there, plus a listing of some of the events coming up for broadcast engineers uh, down toward the bottom. If you want to scroll on that, uh, scroll through that, uh, Suncast, you're welcome to. Uh, but you, these are always articles of interest. Yes, some of them are specifically about Telos. Uh, some are about, uh, hey, we found, uh, you know, this bug in the software. Here's an announcement. You need to update software on this piece of equipment or that piece of equipment. Um, like, right, like right there, the free OmniaVolt update uh, that we've been talking to our dealers about. So now we're up to uh, 1.218. Uh, it's a free update for the Omnia Volt. Uh, and then here, upcoming events. Uh, Koba in Seoul, South Korea. Actually, that just passed because this is a, a few weeks old. Uh, the AES convention in Milan uh, just finished up. Uh, the Western Association of Broadcasters Conference uh, in uh, Alberta, Canada. Infocom is coming up next week in Las Vegas, Nevada. So there, there may be something going on near you that you want to see. Well, guess what? You're not going to get direct current anymore at all unless you go to our website or have answered positively um, in an email that uh, you may have gotten from the TELUS Alliance. You may have noticed that you're getting a lot of emails saying, hey, we've updated our privacy policy. You need to click here if you want to continue getting emails from us. And look, I know your email box is stuffed. There's all kinds of stuff you don't want. And I'm just hoping you do want the TELUS Alliance direct current newsletter. I find it valuable. You know, I'm a broadcast engineer too. Well, go to this page, and actually there is a shortcut uh, for this page. It's telosalliance.com slash opt-in. No punctuation there, just O-P-T-I-N, telosalliance.com slash opt-in. And hey, please, let's stay in touch. Uh, because of these uh, rules from the European Union, um, basically we have to get explicit permission from uh, people who are members of the EU, certainly, uh, to continue to email them. And, uh, you know, Telos Alliance is all over the world. And so it's it's really hard to tell, you know, where people are for sure. So you, you got to do this, whether you're in the EU or not. Go to telosalliance.com slash opt in and uh, you, you'll just fill in your uh, your email address there and let us know that you want to continue to hear from the Telos Alliance. I'm, I'm telling you this because it, it's, it's important. Uh, we appreciate uh, all the people like you who have been getting direct current and other emails from the Telos Alliance. We really are sensitive. We don't like to get spammed ourselves. So we're sensitive to send you things that are valuable that we think you can use. And uh, of course, you're, you're not obligated to read them. But if you want to continue receiving uh, the information, and hey, we've got full-time staffers putting uh, this information together, uh, writing articles about software updates, uh, new techniques, some of it kind of nostalgia. We do some nostalgia articles from time to time found in the attic and a lot of cool stuff uh sometimes we get uh, uh updates on technology from people like frank Foti, uh greg shea jeff stedman cornelius gould uh so uh, marty Sachs has written some articles as well and if you want to keep getting the stuff you've got to tell us actively uh and positively that you want to opt in so tell us alliance.com slash opt in o-p-t-i-n email address and uh, the, the box is already checked, so that's done. And then click the button. And uh, you, you may notice that our page of policy is kind of long. Yeah, there's lawyers involved. There's lawyers involved <laughs> to make sure that we are absolutely legal. Because the I got to tell you, you've been getting all these messages from different companies because the fines from the European Union are unbelievably substantial. Uh, and the TELUS Alliance, we don't want to waste any money paying fines. So uh, we want to make sure that you're informed and you, we have your consent to send you emails. And with that consent, we're going to keep telling you about the great stuff of the TELUS Alliance, like the gear behind me right over here. There's an Omnia 11 uh, with the new uh, GeForce 3.5 upgrade. 
It's pretty amazing. It has the new Pepino Clipper in it from Frank Foti's cat. Or is that from East Wind? That might be from East Wind, his train. And then uh, we have uh, uh, an, an Axia Fusion here behind me on a big screen. Uh, and actually, I'm, I'm in a room full of all kinds of gear, but I'm not going to get up and move everything around. I've got a couple of audio processors behind me turned off because they have big fans in them. Normally, they might go to transmitter site or in a rack room, and I just didn't want the uh, didn't want all the fan noise going on right here. So uh, check us out, if you would, telusalliance.com. And remember to opt in at telusalliance.com slash opt in. Thanks a lot to the Telus Alliance for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. Chris Tobin is along, as almost he always is, and Chris Ark is with us. Let's jump right back, Chris Ark, uh, into sure. um, uh, prepping for uh, for remotes. Sure. What's you know, next? Uh, the, you know, the next the next step is, you know, what what piece of equipment are we going to be using to get the uh, audio to and from the uh, the studio? So, I mean, there are, you know, dozens of manufacturers, but, you know, some of the uh, keystones there are what Telos with the zip unit, Comrex with the access and their new uh, NX series, uh, tie line. And then obviously the Lucy live light complement to uh, uh, a lot of these units. Uh, I primarily use, if I'm running IP, uh, Comrex access. And that's really a, a, a choice of whatever company I'm typically uh, working with at that time. Um but, you know, for my broadcast that I do out at this four-day festival, my primary is actually an ISDN because it's stable, the circuit's already in place, and it's dedicated bandwidth with CD quality. But, you know, it, you know, you guys were speaking on earlier, odds are, if there is an ISDN line there, which is costly, um, you're going to be running an IP codec. So you have to look at, okay, um, where am I? Can I run 4G if that's my only option? Uh, and mm -hmm. if that is your only option, be aware that, you know, when you do your site check a few days ahead of time, um, you might be perfectly good to go. There's, you know, little to no jitter or latency. Uh, but once, you know, a thousand people or, you know, 5,000 people converge at that venue, they're all going to be on that 4G network, um, you know, sucking up bandwidth. So um, when I have the option, I prefer to go hardwire internet connection. Um, you know, because you're not sharing a, a pipe with somebody or as, as many people, and there's less room for interference um, uh, uh, of your actual connection. Now, the one thing that I really, really like about IP codecs is that there's so many features that allow uh, aiding and combating network congestion, jitter, delay. Mm. Uh, you know, one is yeah. uh, forward error correction, uh, where, you know, it sends a, a secondary stream to and from. So that way, if the packets get lost, which inevitably, you know, they're going to get lost somewhere, you have a secondary stream of packets to be able to make up for those lost packets on that primary stream. Uh, new thing, uh, I'm not sure how long it's been around, but is the multiple network bonding that you can do to increase your overall bandwidth. So if you have a Verizon card, Sprint card, um, you know, you can mux those together to get a, a bigger pipe if you have to go with a 4G model. Um, Another cool thing about IP codecs is the agile codec uh, connection. So say that, you know, when you first start your remote broadcast, you know, you have a pipe that allows you to run, let's say, PCM linear or AACLD, you know, to get a really crisp, clear, just in, you know, in-person sounding audio, uh, you know, that's great. But if that, if that network becomes congested, um, you need to be able to relegate that codec back that that's able to run on the bandwidth that, that that's allotted to you at that time. So that that's huge as far as uh, keeping a stable connection going. You know, you're talking about codec technology, and, and that is how most uh, remote broadcasts are done. Of course, an ISDN codec is a codec. Uh, you are absolutely stuck with uh, either 60, 56, 64 kilobits, 112 kilobits, or 128 kilobits per second, uh, depending on your, on your ISDN configuration. Uh, unless some, some ISDN codecs would do multiple lines, but that gets pretty expensive. Um, uh, you, you mentioned even possibly doing PCM linear. And this is pretty interesting. Um, more and more places that stations go to, um, they got the bandwidth to do uh, linear Certainly. point to point. Yeah. And uh, I know that the Cleveland Symphony Orchestra has been doing this um, with uh, with the, the classical station in, in Cleveland. And during the Sochi Olympics, I realize that's been over four years ago now, um, they were actually having trouble with their ISDN getting out of Sochi, Russia. And so some of the networks were, uh, well, some were using Zip1s or, or other brands of, uh, of IP codecs. And some people were using just a, an Axia 
uh, node, like an Axia X node, uh, put it into unicast mode rather than multicast mode. Uh, and that way they can just point it at an IP address and a port number somewhere else like, oh, say, uh, Sweden and and get a linear 24 bit stereo, uh, 48 kilohertz sample broadcast. So, I mean, like really perfect audio quality. It's hard to do yeah, better yeah. Uh, uh, and, and real time. So and, and it's. And we're at this point in technology, and I know you know this better than anybody, but I'll just make the point where you might, you know, your best connection might be a shaky 4G connection, uh, <laughs> or it, it might be fiber, uh, and you've just got terrific connectivity. Uh, our new station in Hawaii that I've just been building, uh, we've got gigabit fiber there. And we've got really good internet here in, in Riga, Latvia. I've been getting literally uh, about 100 megabits per second between here in Riga and uh, in Kauai, uh, in, in the village of Lahui. So, it, it, you know, you can do a lot with 100 megabits per, per second. Now, there's going to be some packet drops, packet loss here and there. So it's good to have uh, codecs that, that make up for that. And linear doesn't typically, unless you have the technology, the forward air correction you were talking about. But m my point is, we're at this point in technology where you kind of got to be ready for anything. And it sounds like th that's part of what you're planning for, being ready for about anything. Well, absolutely. And again, with this particular broadcast that this article is based on, of it's in the middle of the desert, in the middle of nowhere. Um, so you need to make sure you have all your redundancy uh, in place, because when it comes to uh, uh, as far as the PD is concerned, there's no excuses. Once he has all of his on air staff out there doing a four day remote broadcast, you need to you have to be able to deliver. And that's part of the job as a remote broadcast engineer is to anticipate the unexpected. So that way you're going to be a hero when the time comes where you go out, ah, we have an issue, but we took care of it. Don't worry. Go do your thing. Do you typically bring equipment out in short equipment racks or, or stack stuff on top of each other? Well, what's your physical setup look like? Well, I mean, if we're doing just a car dealership or, you know, a circle K van stop, typically I'll just send them out mm -hmm. with a Comrex access with the, with the uh, complimentary mixer built in battery pack. So you know, again, power probably isn't going to be much of a concern. Uh, but again, for these bigger broadcasts, yeah, I have uh, two broadcast racks that I uh, that I bring out. And, uh, you know, that's the next step of this. You know, once you uh, figure out your power and Kodak requirements and what how you're going to be getting to and from, next thing is what are your production requirements? What equipment do you have available to you? So for this big broadcast that I do, uh, I know some people have the luxury of having, you know, uh, Axia nodes out there. Me, I'm rocking old school analog consoles. Uh, you know, with matrice routing and aux sends. But, um, you know, th that's the next step of it. What are your production requirements? And, and talk to your production, uh, talk to your uh, PD and your digital department to find out, you know, how many microphones do we need? Uh, you know, are we going to need sound effect playback on site? You know, do we need to import field audio? You need an audio console that's going to be able to accept all those inputs and spit out enough outputs uh, to, to, uh, make it a successful broadcast. So like console inputs, you know, microphone, station backhaul, feed return, sound effects. Uh, you know, I have Vox Pro uh, out on site for my uh, for my remote broadcasts that are that are larger. And, you know, some oh, of these yeah. broadcasts, I, I do our art, artist performance as well. So you need to be prepared for that. Um, at, at this big country music festival that you mentioned, um, uh, was it called Thunder Country? Uh, country Thunder, yeah. I'm sorry, Country Thunder. Uh, are are you mixing? Are you are you taking a feed off of a house feed for the mixed music on stage? No. So what we do, we actually have a condo that's just a broadcast condo where we come and have uh, uh, the artists do interviews. They might hook up an acoustic oh, okay. guitar for a personal little uh, uh, performance. Uh, but no, gotcha. no, we don't take the, the the main stereo bus feed from there. Um, gotcha. But, you okay. know, okay. Uh, okay. on the yeah. point of, on the point of setup. Uh, you know, once you figure out, you know, how many ins and outs do I need? How many cameras am I going to be feeding? Draw it out on on paper to figure out, you know, is this signal flow going to work properly? Are we going to have feedback issues? And not only that, but is a normal board op or on air channel going to be able to operate this robust setup that you just did? Because if it's so complicated that no one can run it, well, you probably didn't do it right. So you might have to scale things back a little bit. Um, so here's a, and when I'm out on, a, a, yeah, go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. Here's a question about remote broadcast, whether it's a, a car dealership, a county fair, 
uh, or a, a large broadcast. So let's say you've got a broadcast center uh, so where, where you know one person or maybe several people are, but then you've got maybe a, somebody out in the field, somebody at the other end of the car lot or somebody over at the pony rides at the fair or somebody, uh, you know, in, in another uh, red carpet booth or some or at the red carpet uh, at, at some some awards event. What are some of the ways that you would connect uh, audio back and forth with that person who's not very far away? They may be 100 feet away. They may be 1,000 feet away. But what are some techniques? Sure. And, and while you're answering that, do you necessarily need to bring that audio back to, let's say, wherever your main broadcast is, is, is emanating from, I mean, at the remote site? Right, right. Or could that person just be on a separate line back to the studio and let somebody at the studio mix that in, take them you know, in and out of, of the broadcast? Right. Well, you know, as far as having them on separate units, let's just use the access rack unit as an example. You know, some stations, they might only have one access rack unit, but you still have to get, you know, audio from, let's say, the live performance tent all the way back to the broadcast condo. So, uh, you know, in this instance, depending on how far away they are, I might just deploy a wireless microphone with, um, um, you know, some parasitic uh, uh, antennas, you know, coming off the uh, wireless receivers. But uh, you know, say that it's it's not within the range of using a wireless mic. Uh, out at this festival, I actually deploy Ubiquity uh, rocket links. So what I'll do is I'll actually take an IP codec, put it on a 192 address, and have a brick link uh, at one site, and then have um, a brick link over at the broadcast condo to bridge that gap. Wow. Hey, uh, Chris Tobin has a little bit of experience with doing remotes that way, don't you, Chris? Well, I was going to say that sounds awfully familiar. That paper I presented uh, pretty much talked about that. And I'm glad somebody else was thinking of it. Uh, that makes total sense. That's, that's a good way to do it. Yeah. Uh, you, you, uh, uh, Chris Ark, you mentioned a specific Ubiquity model. So what, 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 what is this looking like? The Ubiquity gear that's used locally for a, a local short, short shot. Uh. I can't remember exactly. They're just the Ubiquity. Uh, maybe they're nanos. Uh, you know, the real small units that you can put up on a hurry up mast, okay, uh, run yeah, power over yeah. Ethernet down into a switch. Nothing, nothing fancy. Um, pr pretty simple, simple setup overall. Kirk, it's the and same ones you, we used at, yeah. at PREC. Yeah. At PREC. Um, For the show. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, we have okay. a ketchup bottle, but yes. I was going to say, is this the <laughs> That's how I know it. Is, the, is this the one that fits on a ketchup bottle? <laughs> That's correct. Call, you are correct, call, sir. Oh, ubiquity. I, I want the same model that Chris Tobin hooks to a ketchup bottle <laughs> for stability. That's that's a little secret, Chris Ark. You know that uh, Chris Tobin has ketchup bottle has the right amount of ballast to hold uh, hold that up while you're sitting at your dining table doing a live remote broadcast. <laughs> I didn't know that. I did not know that. <laughs> yeah. See, I, I think mean, mustard I bottle may work too. Yeah. Uh, it, it's got to be full. Okay, so so you you have this kind of planning going on. You've you've picked your codec, and I think we're at such a cool point in technology where, uh, you, yeah, I, I realize people have budgets. If you've got a Telesip one, if you've got a Comrex Access or NX or a Tyline product, you've got your codec, and and we know that you know these code this codec technology has gotten pretty good, uh, and a lot of them are pretty good at at mitigating uh, uh, problems. You were talking about about mitigation if your data available data path is varying quite a bit you know the the bet the the uh the benefit of uh agile uh data rate on your codec is this if it's not agile then you kind of need to set the codec for the lowest bit rate that you think your path right. will handle and you've got to leave it at that the whole time and so if you right, think right and, and, man, and make sure you leave a little bit of a buffer too you know leave you know only sure. utilize maybe about 80 85 percent of uh uh of that bandwidth because you want a little uh, headroom there so you don't uh, totally lose all packets. And, and and so with agile technology, you could you could run at 384 kilobits per second uh, of AAC uh, uh, coding, and if things got bad, you know it, it'll it'll kick into high efficiency AAC and kick it on down to you know some low bit rate if you had to. And and I, I, I'm sure other products do it too, but I know that the Telos Zip One uh, does this very well. It steps to different bit rates uh, as as the as the need arises. What's exciting though, and I'm I'm glad we're finally at this point in technology where. Um, 
the available data rate at so many locations is just getting better and better and better. Now, I realize if you're out in, in a stadium with 100,000 other people, you know, you may have some pretty crummy uh, data on your cell phone. And we actually heard about a solution to this uh, a couple weeks ago with a guy named Josh Bone. Uh, talking about a service called Max Connect, that's a branded service, but it it, it, it they uh, they've purchased a QoS service through Verizon, and uh, they said we can be sitting there with a rock solid uh, half a meg per second uh, or more, whatever we've uh, we, we've arranged for, while everybody else around us has has little or no connectivity, and we're all using Verizon. Yeah. So that that kind of 4G LTE connectivity is be, uh, with QoS is becoming a reality and becoming a, a, a available to broadcasters for a price, but it's available. But it, I own literally I own a cabin in the woods in East Tennessee in the mountains, and I get 60 megs down and about 12 megs up from my cable provider, and it, it's pretty rock solid. We do the show from there when I'm at the cabin. So I mean, and this is. It's it's pretty bad switchback roads to get up there, you know. It's 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 away from uh, from civilization. So sure. if, if, if there's more places where we're getting the kind of bandwidth, where uh, uh, and I, here's a dirty little secret: someday, at some day in the future, I think Telos and Comrex and Tyline are kind of going to be out of the codec business uh, because we're going to have enough bandwidth on normal what are then become normal connections to. Get linear audio out. Now we still may need some techniques for, for reliability, but I think it's going to be pretty common. Uh, I'm, I don't, I don't mean tomorrow, uh, but you know, down the road. Hey, how much could happen in five years with five G LTE coming out? I mean, what if it was just amazing? So anyway, I'm sorry, didn't mean to, to slow you down. I'm sure there's a lot more to <laughs> talk about and practice and uh, uh, and and get ready for on on your uh, on your broadcasts. Howdy. Yeah, so uh, you know, Go you know, ahead. once you Go have ahead, your your codec your codec requirements all figured out, and you know, you know what audio console that you're going to be using. Probably it's going to be a live broadcast console. The next thing for me is microphone selection. Um, really, the first factor of microphone selection is what's available to you at your radio station. It might just be a, a Shure SM58. You might have some RE20s, 27s laying around. Um, you know, there's been a few broadcasts where I've had the luxury of using a Neumann TLM103, or I have a few road broadcasters I can bring out, but it takes careful consideration on what microphones am I going to use? Um, you know, mm -hmm. if you're going to be in a dusty, damp, windy, noisy environment, that's what I automatically default to a large diaphragm condenser, or excuse me, a dynamic microphone like an RE20, RE27, uh, because it can withstand that, just that abuse, the off access rejection, um, it, it is good to, to, to get rid of that, uh, ambient broad or ambient noise. Um, you know, and, and then say that you want to use a, a condenser microphone like this one here, you know, if it's a noisy environment, really windy, well, it's going to pick up every little sound that, that that's around that immediate area. And another thing to consider if you're thinking about using a, a condenser microphone is think about how the capsule is actually made. Um, you know, you have a back plane right here, and then in front of it, you have that diaphragm. Well, in between those, you know, you have potential, you have voltage going in there, because that's what actually creates a signal is the difference in the voltage when you're talking into the microphone. Well, that's more or less a capacitor, right? So if moisture, dust gets in there, this capsule can short out, and you're not even going to get any audio out of it. And if you do, it's going to be less than desirable uh, sonic quality. So it's just one thing. Uh, to, to think about when you think you're going to be fancy and, oh, I'm going to bring out a condenser microphone to this broadcast. Well, what's your broadcast environment? you got to really think about that. So uh, dynamics control uh, is probably, well, it could be pretty important at a remote site. You know, it's hard enough to get air talent to pay attention to the level meters, and, and that's part of why uh, we we tend to use mic processing uh, in, in, in the studios. Um, really? Do you plan on, do you use mic processing out in the field where they may even be paying less attention to levels? Oh, absolutely. Uh, but, you know, with the caveat, if we're doing a van stop or something like that, where a promotions assistant's going to set this up, um, you know, no, I'm just going to send them out with some 50, uh, 58s and, and a little, little Comrex mixer. But for this broadcast, absolutely. Um, you know, mm -hmm. I, I gravitate towards the Aphex products. Um Mm -hmm. you know, I actually still use the the legacy 230s out in the field there because it's 
you know, it's great. Uh, you know, they have built-in EQ, compression, uh, the RL exciter, and the gating. Uh, so again, when you're doing a multi-day broadcast with your on-air talent, the PD wants that that to sound as, as, as polished as possible. They don't want to hear a Yamaha analog console mic pre. Uh, they, they want it broadcast quality right out of the gate. Uh, now, that being said, not everybody is afforded that luxury of of being able to rip out $1,000 mic processors out of their studios to take them out to a dusty environment. So, I mean, there's some analog consoles out there, even digital consoles, if you're running one of those, that have built-in compression, uh, that have some dynamic control. Uh, so, no, absolutely. Um, you know, because sometimes, you know, on-air talent, they'll, they'll be talking like this. And next thing you know, they're back here like this, off access to the mic, and they totally disappear. <laughs> it's, it's, it's amazing to me that, you know, uh, that, that that's their job. But they're, you know, they're talking way over here on the mic when they should be right here. So dynamic about, control is huge. What about using sports headsets? Now, I, I own uh, four sets of those. And when this show, this podcast is on the road, uh, sometimes we all don sports headsets and go through a, a little cheap mixer and, and use that because then we have then our hands are free. We don't have to worry at all about the mic because it's going to be right there the whole time. When is a sports headset appropriate? Obviously for sports, but when else? Uh, you know what? To be honest with you, Kirk, I don't I don't use a lot of sports headsets, but uh, uh-huh. you know, if if I have a certain talent that I know that that likes to move around a lot, you know, they're they're constantly going like this. Uh, I'll try to persuade them to put on like a Sennheiser sports sports headset or something, but it's met with with a lot of resistance. Uh, not quite sure why, but uh, they're, they're they're creatures of habit. Um, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, not not much experience well, you, with trying to deploy those. If you can get the play by play announcers uh, to to do your remote broadcast, I'll bet they're willing to wear sports headsets. Oh, I bet they are. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Maybe maybe not so much the morning team, but the but the play by the, the play by play people uh, sh- should be able, should be willing to. It, it, I know it helps yeah. us out and in a noisy environment because most of them have really good reject you know noise rejection. And because uh, if you if you've done a broadcast from a basketball court, you know how incredibly noisy a basketball arena can be, and sure. you've got to be able to hear those announcers. And, and odds are most of those capsules, and please correct me if I'm wrong, they're probably hypercardioid, so it has a lot of off access rejection. Correct. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yep. So, um, oh. one of the, uh, the one of the last topics we'll get to is ventilation because I'm I'm absolutely. really glad you included that in your paper. But before we get to that topic to consider last, is there anything else you want to bring up about planning and and that actually now executing uh remote broadcasts? Like you know, what like during the broadcast, what do you need to watch out for, be cautious of, be careful of or handle before it becomes a problem? Uh, you know what, again, uh, where's, where's your power coming from? Know where your power is coming from. Because again, uh, I hate to keep going back to it, but this, this country music festival that I do, the reason I have my primary backhaul feed is my ISDN is because it's independent of any power that I'm being provided. Um, my ubiquity links that provide me my internet 50 symmetrical backhaul is tied to a, a breaker panel that has seven or eight Provost tour buses. Uh, uh, oh, the, 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 big, the big tour buses. Oh, yeah. Okay. So yeah. They're all plugged yeah. in shore power with. All right. You betcha. Yeah. So know where your power is coming from and know who your contacts are. Uh, don't don't wait mm-hmm. to be in the heat of the moment. And go, oh, who's the power guy? Who do I need to get in touch with? Make those relationships ahead of time. So you already have them on speed dial in your phone. They're no, you know, they know to expect you when and if something comes up um, and have uh, tech support on hand, too, for whatever. Uh, service provider that you're using to CenturyLink. Uh, they've always been really good to me, um, you know, to get out and repair any issues if there's ever been uh, been any issues. Uh, you know, uh, this another is a good, thing like, like a, yeah. sorry? I was just going to say, this is a good point for Chris Tobin to come in because uh, Chris has often uh, uh, chided us, warned us, and, and encouraged us to have these numbers handy for, you know, anything that you're depending on along the way. Make sure you know how to contact them quickly and easily. So you're not fumbling to look for that when you've got an emergency going on. And uh, I, I wonder, besides just the phone numbers, uh, I mean, is it, it seems like, you know, if you know somebody's name, a manager's name, uh, or it, are there any other keywords to say, we're doing a live broadcast, we're nationwide on the, I mean, does that make any difference or not to the people answering the phone with uh, entering a, a, a trouble ticket, whether it's for internet or power or telephone or whatever the service may be that you're, that you're looking for? What's some advice about 
not only having the numbers, but having other information of, of, that would help you get it fixed quickly. Yeah, know your know your menu options. Have those written down already. Press one, two, five, nine to get to the media bureau desk for them to resolve issues. Because uh, you know, odds are, if you're deploying a service like this, uh, you're going to have a QoS. So the last thing they want to do is is hear from you. And if they do hear from you, they want to be able to get it resolved. So, um, you know, know the menu options and know who to talk to. Always have your uh, again in the instance of. Um, ISDN, have your SPID numbers available, have your circuit number available. Uh, and the same can be said in the world of IP of know your, you know, what's my IP addresses, what's my subnet mass and my DNS, all that stuff. Have all that right right available. Uh, because if you call a tech up, you know, at uh, Verizon or whatever your IP provider might be, you know, if you read off a list of all oh, my subnets, you know, X, Y, Z, they might go, oh, that's wrong. We need to get that corrected. And then boom, all of a sudden uh, you're up and rolling. So, yeah. Know your know your circuit info. Got you. Chris Tobin, you have anything to add to that? Oh, yeah, I will add to the following one. Um, yes, it does help when you call the support desk that the show that you're calling about, the, I'm sorry, the service interruption for the show you're broadcasting may have a high profile uh, uh, talent. I will tell you that two weeks ago, we uh, had our one of our ISDN circuits just go belly up literally the morning of a broadcast we're going to do that evening with the governor's office, uh, the governor of New Jersey. And I did not use that card on the call to uh, Verizon, who was the carrier, at first. I called on the circuits down hard. We've got the situation. Here are the SPIDs. Here's the uh, circuit ID. Here's even the underground cable number. I have all that information. And then they tell me, well, our commitment, meaning the next available surface call, will come on date X. I'm like, well, that's the day after the event that we're trying to do. She goes, well, I understand, <laughs> but we're kind of backlogged. I said, well... I have to now sort of up the ante on this situation. And she's like, what do you mean? The circuit is for the broadcast for the governor's Ask the Governor show on tomorrow night. Is there any way we can, you know, increase priority? That afternoon, I had two techs splicing team on site. <laughs> <laughs> they were very nice about it. It doesn't happen often, but they understood yeah. the severity. I said, look, I'm, I'm playing this card because I don't know what else to tell you because I, I understand where you're coming from, but you got to help me. The CEO is literally four blocks from this building. So there's got to be some way somebody can get to help us. We're not out in the middle of nowhere. So it's got to be, and they, they came out and they took care of it. And I will say they were very up on it. And they, this, the team that came out, one of the guys is like, so um, this is for the governor's show? I was like, yeah, it's one of the circuits for the show. He goes, okay, got it. And they went on their merry way. Got a name and, drop uh, once in a while. Well, it was a situation where they literally told me I we can't get anybody out to you until the day after the, the need of the show, the circuit. I'm like, eh, that's not going to work. So we had two days to work with, and uh, mm -hmm. they were nice about it. So, yes, it does help. The other thing, when you're doing circuits, say in the case of IP, because we're all doing a lot of that now, sure, when you place the order, if you say it's if it's a DSL or it's a cable modem drop or whatever you choose, make sure you ask them, if you're doing a static IP, make sure it's a static single IP, or if it's a range, make sure they give you the range. Ask them to give you what range they've assigned. The net mask will tell you the range or the number of IP addresses you have. All that information, as Chris pointed out, you definitely need to have in on hand. What I do is I print it out on a small little piece of paper that I attach it to the codec that's going to be using that information. Why? Uh, because I may not be there while one of my guys is, and the problem may occur. He can look down and verify the information in the codec matches what's on the label. So that sort of shortens the time between troubleshooting and panic. And, and that helps. So keep that in mind. Matter of fact, we do a show here every month with the mayor's office, and it involves going off-site and using uh, vMix to do our Facebook Live stuff. And the computer that we travel with, I actually have on it the sticker for the IP addresses that we've been assigned for the show at the venue that we go to every month. And it paid off because one day I was I had to step away, and one of the other guys called and said, hey, we can't connect. It's good. There's no internet service on the computer. What do we do? I said, just look at the little piece of paper, open up the network properties, verify that it's not on DHCP and it's static IP. Sure enough, there was a digit off. It's problem solved. Literally 10 ah. minutes, they were back up and running, ready for the show. I know it seems simple. Or it may seem like, wow, that's crazy. That's stupid. Why not do this? Don't get, don't get the crazy thing with using your iPhone or your Android phone as the source for all information. Stick the paper Those on the can equipment. go dead. <laughs> they can go dead, or you got to sit there and scroll through your papers and expand the image and go, uh, then you have to put it down. If it's type, taped to the codec, you literally are looking at the codec while both hands are free, typing in the information on your laptop, if that's your method, or the front panel. Yeah. 
Try yeah. it sometime. Cool. That's a that's a great idea. And Chris, I got one follow up question though. You, you're the way you're talking. You're you're kind of implying that the the codec uh, is being attached to the DSL circuit without uh, w- without a router between it and the DSL. Is is that what's happening? That's a possibility. Uh, maybe you're in a okay. venue that you're already behind a firewall, and they're giving oh, you IP okay. addresses. Okay. So in the case of the, a, the, a static, the lo- okay. mayor show, okay. we are behind the firewall. It is a local IP, but we've been assigned the IP address to our Mac on the computer that we've said we'll use every month. So these are other gotcha. things you can do. If you have recurring broadcasts and you're working with a venue and the IT department, they're more than happy to work with you if you can tell them or at least offer up, hey, can we assign the Mac to the IP so you don't have to create a separate list? See, not every play, it's not easy maintaining a static IP list on a huge uh, network. So a lot of IT right. administrators will say no to static IP. But if you offer up the Mac address and say that this is what I'm going to use every time I connect to your network, then they'll say, okay, tell you what, we'll assign the IP to Mac. We're good. Thank you very much. The reservation is now set up that fashion. They don't have to create a list. That's something also so understand you, who you're dealing with and how their operation is working because you can't ask them to change this. Most IT departments and most venues that you're going to go to as a broadcaster have no idea of the mission critical need of what you're doing. So you have to sort of educate yeah. them, but in a very low impact way. We have and got also, to and take also a quick, communicate. The, the, oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, just make sure you communicate with their IT departments, the ports that you might need opened uh, for that codec oh, yeah. to, to talk back and forth. Because there's, I mean, you know, a casino, uh, you know, a larger venue, they have their network locked down as tight as they possibly can. So, uh, you know, make sure you know what ports uh, you need to have opened up for that particular flavor of codec. Good advice, especially, you know, it, it, we're a lot of us are used to a home environment or a small business environment where Outgoing ports are no problem. It's incoming that that are blocked, except for ones that you might forward here and there. Um, but in a university setting, in a large corporate setting, outgoing stuff is going to be blocked too, unless they unblock it. Or I was at a university where you could go outgoing, uh, but it would shut back down within a few seconds, and it just turned out that uh, the IT department needed to increase that time uh, on the IP addresses that we were using so that they wouldn't shut down before a keep alive pack was sent hey uh, we got to take a quick break and be back uh, with our with kind of a, a big tip of the week which from chris ark's point of view is going to be about ventilation uh you wouldn't believe how important that is especially if you're out in the hot sun doing a live remote broadcast and your equipment is in black cases oh my gosh this can be a serious problem so we'll be, we'll be back we're going to hear from our friends at lavo uh, at lavo.com slash tort and we'll be right back with the show There has probably never been a better time in history to buy a new radio mixing console. Today's consoles are more sophisticated than ever, with more features and functions than you can shake a stick at. But have you noticed how complicated they are? There's a sea of knobs and switches and displays and buttons. Some of them look like you might need a pilot's license to do your show. Well, a board doesn't have to be complicated to be powerful. Just look at the new Ruby mixing surface from Lavo. The first thing you notice is how smooth and streamlined it is. Ruby has lots of cool tech, but what it doesn't have is that confusing ocean of buttons that clutter things up. Now, we all know that there are some console features that Jock only uses once in a while. So why dedicate controls to them? Ruby fixes this problem by moving those once-in-a-blue-moon controls to a touch-sensitive, customizable GUI that happily shares screen space with your other studio software, helping you fight control room clutter. Thanks to this design innovation, talent that use Ruby produce smoother shows with less errors. Controls that are used the most fall naturally to hand, while functions that rarely need adjustment are easily controlled with just a couple of clicks in the context-sensitive GUI. And Ruby has cool features you won't find on other boards, like AutoMix, an intelligent gain writing function that guarantees the perfect mix for multi-mic morning shows and call-in segments. Dual-mode snapshots that instantly switch the motorized faders between on-air and production modes. And enough DSP and I.O. options to make even your pro sound pals green with envy. And because quality is as important to Lavo as it is to you, Every console is proudly built to fanatically precise standards at Lavo's own factory in Germany. 
If you're ready to declutter your control room, do yourself a favor. Check out the new Ruby and the other cool Lavo Radio Tech at www.lawo.com slash twert. Thanks a lot to Lavo for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. And uh, if this technology appeals to you, well, check them out. The website is lavo, L-A-W-O dot com slash twerk. That'll tell them not only that you came here, be- that, that you went to them because you heard it here, uh, which does us a big favor. It also takes you right to the radio gear at Lavo. So check them out. Thanks again, Lavo, for sponsoring the show. All right. We got a, just a couple minutes left in the show. And Chris Ark. Tell us why ventilation and ch- at, uh, what you can do to you know, prevent yourself problems with uh, heat at remote sites out in the hot sun. Oh, my goodness. Especially uh, cut my teeth out in Arizona. There was uh, maybe aside from site checks, the biggest factor uh, that I needed to get figured out is where am I going to be? And is this equipment going to be cool enough to operate properly? I've seen ISDN units, mixing consoles, just to start doing some crazy erratic things because it's just choked of, of any ventilation and that heat gain that, you know, it, it just it totally throws off the equipment. So, you know, you have to ask yourself, does this equipment have enough ventilation to operate properly in its working environment? So when I when I have the, the, the ability to do so, I try to leave one RE rack spacing in between my equipment. Now, if you're flying with equipment, you know, having that spacing might add two or three more flight cases onto your itinerary, and that's the last thing you want to do. So say that you don't have um, the ability to, to have that one RU separation. I try to install on the very top row of my rack uh, an inline fan that, um, you know, can help pull uh, uh, air across that equipment and, and get rid of that heat. Um, the other thing that I'll do is, is if I don't mind putting a hole in my SKB case, I'll actually cut a hole in the very top, then install debris, you know, a little guard in there so that that air can exhaust right out of the top. If that isn't an option, hopefully your case has rear rack rails where you can install a fan horizontally to literally draw equipment or draw the heat right away from the equipment. Um, it's really whatever your comfort level is, but I can't stress enough. Make sure your equipment is properly ventilated if you want it to work properly, especially in the digital realm. I mean, it's it's a computer. You know, if, if components can shut down and stop operating properly, if they're just 200 degrees, it just it doesn't work that well. So it, it sounds like you're really implying that that active cooling, that is making sure air is is forced or pulled through a rack system is really key. Don't just leave it to convection cooling. Correct. No, no, you need to be active in that and actually sucking air away. Um, uh, yeah, just to leave it, just to let it breathe on its own. Even if you have one RU spacing, sometimes that case can still get really, really hot. You know, there's been times mm-hmm. where I've been out on site where I've scrambled to the general manager's office to get, you know, a little desk fan to put behind the rack just to try to draw away whatever uh, heat that I could. Uh, same can be said in the live mix environment, you know, because I'm mixing an audio and performances in a tent and the bridge of that audio console gets so hot that you can barely touch it. So, mm-hmm. you know, in the digital realm, especially make sure that you're, you're actively trying to mitigate uh, heat gain. Uh, in, in today's age, uh, it's not expensive to go get yourself one of those pop-up tents, one of those uh, you know canopy covers. Uh, you, you, if you got if you're doing an outdoor concert or uh, or interviews outdoors, if you're at a, a, a sports game or a race, uh, sounds like a great idea to uh, at least sh- provide some shade and not be in the direct sunlight. Sunlight provides 600 and plus watts of heating for every square yard, uh, so that that you know, that adds up in a few minutes. Yeah, yeah, and be wow. careful if uh, if anybody ever has the solution of using a swamp cooler uh, to cool down your equipment. Uh, water and electricity and equipment, you know, uh, it's just, yeah. it, that doesn't work out so hot sometimes. The swamp cooler, is, is that the big fan with some air mist going through it? Is that what that is? It, it, yeah, exactly. Again, it's a, it's a yeah. kind of a keystone to, uh, uh, to Arizona because it's just it gets so darn hot out there that they go, oh, put a swamp cooler in. It's like, well, you're blowing it right on my audio consoles. <laughs> it doesn't work yeah. out too well. Yeah. Uh, wow. Wow. Hey, uh, uh, Chris Tobin, you got any last comments or any, any tip for us before we have to go? Yeah, sure. Uh, tips of the trade, uh, tools of the trade for re- remote broadcasting. Here's one. This is a Shure yeah. tone generator, XLR on one end, 
400 hertz tone. That's good for quickly testing on your inputs. Then there's the Q-Box, which has got a built-in speaker, and you can listen to the audio sources and destination. So if you're running around with multiple cables on site. Then there's also that condition, oh, yeah, what if the cables are bad? How do I know? Well, you could do this particular <laughs> yep. brand. It's a Swiss Army. And you turn it on. Those the lights are in crazy position. And I press to see if my phase, uh, my wiring is correct. And then, look, it's a nice diagonal line. So these cables are working like they should. So that problem isn't there. And then, last but not least, let's not forget, you're at a remote location. Multiple cables everywhere. Odds are you're going to be mixed in with other people. Remember these? Yeah. Yeah, Lordy. Absolutely. Okay. It's a number. Number your cables. Okay. You'll probably be the only one who has numbers on his cable. And you could do the color tape approach if you want, but everybody does. But the numbers, you create your own system. So with these tools, you too can have a successful remote broadcast. <laughs> and if I might interject, one other piece of equipment that you want to have is a cable, a Cat5, Cat6 cable tester with you. Oh, yes. yes. Uh, you know, you, Absolutely. You, 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 know, you could have your setup back, at your, uh, back in your shop there and go, oh, my cables are working great. And it only takes one little kink to, to get that impedance off. And all of a sudden, you're not transmitting the way you should be. Uh, cables can go bad. So make sure you have your tester and a good RJ45 uh, repair kit with you. Oh, so true. You hear it at uh, at this uh, conference center in, in Riga. We were setting up on uh, on Sunday and Monday and a little bit on Tuesday, and we came across about six bad cables. I'm thinking, <laughs> no wonder the development guys are having trouble. This cable's bad. And you know what we did yeah. with the bad cables? We threw them away. They're in the, Hack the they ends out off, throw in them the garbage. Away. Uh, yeah, yep, yeah, absolutely. Oh, oh man, hey uh, guys, we got to go. Uh, we're just about out of time, and I so much appreciate it. Chris Ark. Thank you for joining us. I hope that uh, after you get to your your new position in life, uh, you you find some good experiences, and you'll come back on the show and tell us about them. Uh, absolutely, the pleasure is all mine. I'm honored. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Uh, we appreciate you, Chris Tobin. Thank you for taking the time to be with us, and great advice on uh, on your uh, tools for the trade for doing remote broadcasts. <laughs> Oh, yeah, absolutely. Trust me, it works. And just the, the equivalent would be count Cat5 cable testers and, and making kits. Absolutely. Hey, you know what, uh, Chris, if you wouldn't care after the show's over, would you just send me a, a, a couple of links to some of the things that you just showed off there? I didn't get the names of them quickly enough, and I'd love to put them in our show notes. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, okay. Yeah, well, both Chris's. Yeah, if you, either one of oh, you, sorry. if you have anything you want me to put in the show notes. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, he, he, yeah no, no, Chris's Chris 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 stuff is definitely one in there, too. Links. Good, 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 good. Okay. Hey, we got to go. Uh, our show this week in Radio Tech has been brought to you by the Telos Alliance. Be sure you go to telosalliance.com slash opt in. Thank you very much. You'll stay on our mailing list and we can't email you anything without that. We really can't. We'll get in big trouble. Uh, and also thanks to Lavo at lavo.com slash twerk. That's L A W O dot com slash twerk. Thank you so much to Suncast, our producer, did a great bang up job today. Really appreciate you. And also uh, to um, Andrew Zarian, who's the founder of the GFQ Network. Uh, next week, we have a really interesting guest. Can't tell you much about it. I don't know much about it. We're going to find out about it. It's pretty cool, whatever it is. Uh, I know that's, that's just, that's too cryptic by half, but it's going to be a good show. We'll see you next week on This Week in Radio Tech. Bye bye. <laughs>